At WordFence, we have the motto, Think Like a Hacker. And the idea behind it is that if you can identify potential vulnerabilities, ways in which your site can be compromised or attacked, then it helps you to defend against an attack because you know what to expect, what to defend against. So a good way to look at it is, if say your site has a file upload feature, well, when you allow users to upload files, you need to consider where the files are going, how the files are accessed, what files are uploaded. Can the user directly call the files? If so, will the files be executed? What happens if a file is executed? And so on. And these are lots of different things you need to take into account when you allow file uploads. But if you don't have file uploads on your site, then most of them you don't have to think about. You don't have to worry about it all. And a lot of the lower level system things, like what can the files access on your system, for example, aren't as important because it's less of a threat. And you have more important things to deal with when you don't have file uploads than all the things associated with file uploads. And so that's thinking like a hacker. It's looking at your application. It's looking at how you can be compromised, what problems, what things are vulnerable, and then defending those things and focusing on those things rather than worrying about security theater or the standard checklist of things to fix that may have nothing at all to do with your application. So what we're going to do today is look at an intentionally vulnerable installation of Laravel and we're going to break into it. We're going to look at the different vulnerabilities, the different ways an attacker might ad approach attacking this site, breaking into this site, and we're going to look at the thought process, the reason you know, why you would look why you would know how to break into that, what you're looking for. And hopefully you'll learn something. Hopefully you'll be able to go away and look at your own sites and look at the features in your site and look for things that could be vulnerable and fix up any issues there may be there. So as an attacker, as a hacker, we're going to start on this site. And the first thing we're going to try and compromise, the first vulnerability we're going to look for is the human vulnerability. Because humans are fundamentally flawed. Humans are easy to compromise, humans are forgetful, humans are lazy, and it gives us a really good opening. So we're going to try and log in as the administrator, as a user on this site, and we're going to compromise the login form. So we need two pieces of information to log in as a user. We need their email address and we need their password. So let's figure out the email address first. So first up, let's give this test at valoran.dev a try. Now this user does not have an account on this system. So this gives us the message these credentials do not match. That's very generic. Try Steven, which we, which I know does have an account. The attacker doesn't know, but we're getting the same error message. So as far as the attacker is concerned, we don't know either of those two accounts. Do they exist or not? But that isn't the only thing we can do. We can also try the forgotten your password page. Go in here, Lauren Dev. Run that, and we can't find a user. So this is telling us test at Valoran.dev does not have a user account. But what about Stephen at Valoran.dev? There is a lovely green message telling us that we have found an email address that is valid user on this site. There is one problem, however. This has emailed the user. So the user has received a password reset email, which in many cases, especially if you're a person of interest, this tells you that someone's trying to break into your account if you didn't initiate it. But we don't have to go down that route. We can do something different. We can go to the registration form. And we can go Stephen, and we can go Stephen, Lauren.dev, password, random, enter, boom. The registration form is telling us this email has already been taken. And the best bit is this hasn't informed the user. So the user does not know that we are trying to log, that we're trying to create an account with their email address. So we've now verified that Stephen at Valoran.dev has an account. And we can double check, we can do test. Oops, random password, enter. The error message is gone. So we can know for certainty that Stephen at Valoran.dev has an account and test at Valoran.dev does not. So the next step we can do is to brute force Stephen at Valoran.dev. Now, a brute force attack is where you're trying all sorts of different combinations of passwords and just seeing what hits, what is going to get through. And you could try hundreds, you could try thousands, you could try millions of different passwords, and you might eventually get a hit, you might get in, if the user has used a weak password or a known password. But we can get smarter than that. We don't have to try a million different passwords. Generally, if we want to compromise a site, compromise the account of a user that isn't very secure, that doesn't have much security awareness, there is a good chance they've reused their password. They've used their password on a site over here and a site over here. And the problem with you reusing passwords on multiple sites 
is that if the site over here gets hacked and the passwords are stored in plain text or they're decryptable, then the attacker, then the hacker can get a list of known usernames and passwords, and that's called a credential stuffing list. So I've got such a list here. This is a short credential stuffing list that contains known usernames and passwords that were hacked from a site over here. Now what we can do is we can look in this list for Stephen at Valoran.dev. And we've found our user. This is the user we're trying to compromise the site of. This is the user's password they use on the site over here. Now we'll take it to our site, the one we're trying to break into. Dragon123 logged in as the administrator. Because the administrator of this site used the same password on the account over here as the, our site here over here. And so now we're in. We have full access. We're administrator, which is great. We can do whatever we want. So how do you defend against this sort of an attack? And as a user, to protect my account, what you need to do to protect your account as a user is to use a randomly generated unique password on every single site. Which means that the site over here and the site over here have two very different passwords. If your account over here gets compromised and your password was in plain text, it's useless because you can't use it on the account over here because it has a different password. So this account is still safe, even though the account over there has been compromised. But the question you always get after you say, use a randomly generated unique password is how the hell do I remember it? Now, for that, the answer is you don't. You don't need to remember it because you can use a password manager. So I use one password. I think it is absolutely fantastic and I recommend everyone use it. But ultimately, you've got to just use a password manager. And there are many different options. There's LastPass, there's EndPass, um, KeyPass. There's a whole bunch of different options of various different levels and ways they work depending on what you need. But they all operate in the same way in that you store your passwords in the password manager and you don't have to remember them. Generally, the password manager will let you generate a password. It will generate a password for you. So you don't even have to do that. All you have to do when you're creating an account is use the password manager to generate the password, save the password in the password manager. Next time you go to log in, you ask the password manager to log you in. All you have to remember is the password for your password manager. And that's protected using different methods that make it really hard for an attacker to compromise. And you use a strong password for that. And you only have to remember the one strong password that gets you into the password manager. But this is still solving, the, this is not solving the users of my site problem. It's solving the my account problem. It's securing my account. But it's not securing the accounts of the users of my site. So what you need to do is encourage the users on your site to use quality passwords, to use randomly unique, randomly generated unique passwords. So there's a site called Pwned Passwords, which is part of Have I Been Pwned by Troy Hunt. And it's a list of known passwords that have been exposed in data breaches. And currently, if we look at the number over here, there's over 613 million passwords in the database. And the great thing about this is you can type any password in. So I'll type in password and it will tell you how many times it's actually been seen before, how many times the password has been seen in a breach. So this was the password password. It's been seen almost 4 million times. Dragon123 has been seen over 40,000 times. But if I type in this, which is just a random bunch of characters, and I go pwned, it's green. It's a randomly generated unique password. It's never been seen before. And if that was your password, a brute force attack isn't going to get it because it's too long to feasibly generate through the possibilities and it's not going to be in a list of known passwords. So that's a nice secure password. But still, how do you get users to use this? And it's not a case of sending them to this, but you can use the API. So Pwned Passwords have an API and you can hook up your application with it. So I built a, a Laravel package that you can do it with or there are other packages or you can do it yourself manually if you want to. But the point is there is a secure and safe API that you can use to look up passwords in Pwned Passwords and it can tell you the quality of the password. Has it been seen before and how many times? And then you can use that information to inform your users and you can subtly say to them, that isn't a good quality password, use a better password. And depending on your users, you can either block bad passwords or you can just encourage them to fix them. So you can integrate in that in your site and it will help protect your user accounts because it will improve the quality of the passwords. So let's log in as passwords. Now let's look at some code vulnerabilities. So we're logging into this site. Sorry, we're attacking this site. We want to see what we can find, what we can do. 
So when a hacker is attacking a site, they're going to throw random stuff in fields to see what comes out. And such as a registration form, what we're going to try and expose is a cross-site scripting vulnerability. And that is where you can get JavaScript running in the user's browser, running in the victim's browser. So I type my name, evil hacker. Obviously, if you're actually hacking, you wouldn't be this obvious. And then what I'm going to do is put, provide all the different options that could be used to close the tag this is being rendered in in case it's not being rendered correctly. So evil hacker that, and then to make it really easy, we're going to throw an alert, boom, pwned. Obviously you would not throw an alert when you're att attacking a site for real, you'd have something quiet in the background, but for the sake of the demonstration, we want to see it happen. Oops, then hacker, at evilhacker.dev, and then I'll cheat and use that as a password because it's secure-ish, maybe, you know, you make your mind up. Okay, so we're logged, we're now registered as the, and we have an account. There are no pop-ups, so there's no cross site scripting on this page for our user. But the administrator, where's the administrator account? It's hiding from me, here we go. But the administrator, when they're using the site and they're clicking around and they go into admin, boom, pwned. The site administrator has now been pwned. We have now hacked their browser. We are running our JavaScript. Our hacked JavaScript is running in the administrator's browser, which is fantastic for us because we can literally do whatever we want. We can escalate our account to be an administrator. We can create new administrators. We can execute code if there is that facility in the application. We can change settings. You know, the possibilities are endless, really. And so, and so here's we can see the record here where it's loaded up. And there's a bit of funkiness happening here, but because of running JavaScript, we can hide that. And I saw this a number of times when I was cleaning WordPress sites, where you'd go into the administration page and look at the users, and you'd see you know two or three administrator users, and they looked normal. But I noticed at the top where it says administrator users five, and there are two extra administrator users on the site, but they're actually being hidden from the table. They're being removed. And so we could do the same here. We could easily hide that record entirely or make it look like a normal user, even though it's actually our hacked user that's running JavaScript in the victim's browser. So how did this happen? How did we end up here? So we'll check the code and we want to go look in admin. So this is the code for that page and this is the line specifically in here. And so the username, which has got our cross-site scripting, we're escaping it so it's got the double curlies. And we're also passing it in here into this component in the title attribute, which is how you stand as you, how you pass it in in the standard way. Then we go over to the truncate file again, a truncate component, and we can see here where we've got the attributes. Apparently, we're escaping them, and we've got the slots. So everything looks fine, but there is a vulnerability in there. There is a vulnerability in the code in Laravel that was fixed in 7.1.2 that allows cross-site scripting. So we'll jump over and look at the um. Really poor, if I can find it. Here we go. So in they released in, in May last year, an update was released to Laravel um, in, called 7.1.2, which fixed the cross site scripting vulnerability. So there's a vulnerability where tag at, component tag attributes weren't being escaped when they were rendered, weren't being escaped properly when they were rendered. And so passing user input into the attribute and then letting the blade tag attribute system automatically render them was exposing the vulnerability. And so the fix is trivial. As a developer, if you're keeping an eye on the security releases and security updates, then all you need to do to get this fixed would be to... Eee, what's that? No, that's not what I want. One, two. That's it. Cool. So all you need to do in order to get this fixed... Oh, that's the wrong composer. I really am doing well today, aren't I? I there we go. Okay, so all you need to do to get this fixed... Say that again. Is update to the latest version of Laravel. Or in this case, we're going to go to 712. Um, if it eventually gets there. And so what this is going to do is fix this vulnerability by properly escaping the values when it's rendering in the tag. And so as a developer, when you're working on a system, you need to keep an eye on your dependencies, such as the Laravel framework, and watch out for any security updates. And if an update is released, you need it really is a good idea to apply it as soon as possible. Especially for something like this, it's very subtle and you might not realize that you're actually relying on it in your application and it could leave your application vulnerable if you don't apply the update. But the other thing of note here is that we're essentially passing user data into a black box. So what, what do I mean by that? So in here, we're, 
we're relying on this bit, the magic that causes this to work, that makes this work, is what's rendering the user data, and we're relying on it to work. We're relying on this to handle it properly. And if it doesn't, as it didn't, doesn't in this um, vulnerability that we're demonstrating, then it has a problem and it leaves the site um, exposed. It leaves the site vulnerable. So really, when you've got user data, you want to be careful to always render it yourself and always escape it yourself so that you can't fall victim to a vulnerability in one of your dependencies that you're not aware of because you're passing user data in without thinking about it. So if we go back to the page now and we refresh it, where'd it go? Over here, refresh it now, our alert box is gone and the value is properly displayed and it's being escaped as it should be. So that's the fix. Fix was just updating Laravel. Oh, we could rewrite the code if we wanted to as well. So that's that. Okay, so that is the cross-site scripting vulnerability. Now, as an attacker, we're going to look around and see what else we can do. So this message box, it takes messages to encrypt. Type in hello, go encrypt, bingo. So that's our message, that, that encrypted value that's output. And we're going to have a look at the features that are here. So we can see here, it says decrypt and share. So go into decrypt. And decrypt is where it shows the message. But if we look at the URL, have a look around, we'll see this, the four. So the four of the URL indicates to the attacker, indicates to us that this is the model ID and that the numerical, and if the numerical, we can do this. And if we go messages one, what happens? We are now viewing the message from one of the other users, which we shouldn't be able to access because this is a private message. So why are we able to see it? Because there is no protection on this route. So what this route is doing, and we'll just jump over to the code web, is this. So all it is doing is it's checking to see if the user is, user is authenticated, and if they are, then it's letting them view the message. But the problem is, any authenticated user could view any message in the system, while in reality, what we need is a way to only have the owner of the message, the, the user that created the message, to view the message. So luckily, Laravel makes this really easy. We can go and make a message policy. So we'll run PHP Artisan, make policy, message policy. Go back to our code. Go message policy. And what we want here is the view. So we're going to view, oops, expand you out. Um, view, here we go. Okay, going to view, and what we can do is return user ID message user ID. So what we're saying here is that the user can only view the message if the user ID matches the user ID on the message, so the owner of the message. So we'll do that here. Go back into our routes and we can go can view message. So we're adding in middleware that says the user can view, that requires the user to have the policy permissions to view the message. So if we go back to our browser and I refresh it, we now have a 403 because the user has hit the the middleware. The middleware is blocking our access because they don't have permission. But if I go to four, we can view our own. We just can't view anyone else's. So now we've, we've fixed up that vulnerability and we're protecting the messages. So what about the share feature? So we'll jump in here and we'll check the URL and it looks similar. So share ID four, there's a key. So if we change the ID to one, it's gonna give us a 403 because we don't have the right key. So we could try and guess different keys, you know, negative one, whoops, I tried for negative one. And we could do all sorts of different things in here to see if there's any sort of vulnerability, any way that it's, that we can attack it. Um, and we see what comes out. Now, the problem is it's a string and it's always going to be a string and it's a string comparison. So simply changing this value in this instance, isn't going to let us in. What we need is something that isn't a string. We need to force the application to do something unexpected. Because it's a URL parameter, I can just do that. And now what I'm telling it is I'm passing key as an array rather than a string. I go enter and we get this error message. String compare expects parameter one to be a string, array given. So this, now we have an error. Now we have a problem. We've broken something, which from an attacker's point of view is fantastic. Not only that, but this is the debug mode enabled screen. Now, this is really, really handy as an attacker because we can see the code that failed. And we can look in here to see if there's anything specific that will allow our hack up here to work. 
We can also look at things such as the request information, which has got our session payload, the debug information, so the database queries, you've got context, so the ver application versions, which is very helpful if you're looking for vulnerabilities. Because if you can find they're running a vulnerable version, then you can see what you can break in with that. Under user, we can do the user record, which in this instance isn't very interesting, but in some instances you could have private administrated notes on the user record, which could be very valuable to learn. And under app, we have this. This is the route parameter, the model, which has all the data for ID number one. Now, if we look in here, we've got ID one, user one, message, here is our decrypted plain text message that's supposed to be secret that we're not supposed to access. Here's the encrypted string, and here's the key. With this, we have full access to view the record. We don't even need to complete the job and throw that back into the URL, but we can. Now we have a working share link that looks like we have permission to share it, and we can see everything that's supposed that's there, even though we're not supposed to be able to access it. Super, super simple. And the reason for this is because debug mode was enabled. So disabling debug mode is trivial. Throw back into your code. Dot env, you want to go here and go false. I go back here and I go back to, oops, throw it as an array. Now I have a server error. This is not leaking any information. Granted, yes, it's going to throw errors on the server, but there's no information being returned. As the attacker, we know nothing from this screen. And that's how we fix that problem. And I cannot stress highly enough, hard enough, how much you do not want to have debug mode enabled on anything on the internet. So definitely not on production ever. On your staging and QA sites, you really don't want it enabled if they're live, if they're on the internet. Because if someone can access them and figure out how to get a debug screen, which usually isn't hard on staging or QA when you've got code that isn't quite complete yet, you often have more problems, more errors, more vulnerabilities. If an attacker can get into debug mode on there, you can help them to break into your staging site. And if you can break into staging site, you can often get from there to production and get into the rest of the network. And there's been many cases where big companies have been compromised through their staging sites because they haven't properly defended against it. So just don't turn debug mode on. Don't have it enabled and anything on the internet is a good rule. Okay, so as an attacker, we will, you'll generally be trolling. If you're trying to break into a site, you'll look for other vulnerabilities in things like the application that it's running, the frameworks, or if you like attacking Laravel sites, you'll keep an eye on the security releases and see what's coming on. So when I was preparing this talk, I saw this security release and I skimmed it and then three words caught my eye. Remote code execution. Now, remote code execution is the holy grail of an attacker's playbook. If you can get that on a site, you, you've won. You've got whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you need. Now, reading a bit further in this line, we can see here, where's my mouse, that what it says is that applications using a cookie session driver that are exposing an encryption oracle are vulnerable to remote code execution. And this immediately screamed to me object, object deserialization because the session information, if it's stored in a cookie, is being serialized up and encrypted as a string. And so if we can control the value that is being deserialized into the session, then we can re execute remote code because deserialization rebuilds classes. And if you can rebuild classes, you can inject things into other classes that are available and if there are classes that actually allow you to run code in some parts of them, then you can inject things into those and it lets you run code on the sites that you're hoping to run code on. So this site, as it turns out, has got the cookie that is using cookies to store its session information. So we'll jump over here into the application cookies and we can see here the huge payload. That is our cookie, cookie value. So I'll grab all of that and I'll dump it into our decryption box and decrypt. And that is the, the contents of the session that is being stored in the cookie. And the fantastic thing here is that this means this is an encryption oracle because the encryption key used to encrypt and decrypt the messages from this is the same as the key used over here, which means we can modify our payload, our session payload here dump it into the browser and the browser will send it to the server and then we can potentially execute code. So how do we do that? Well, what we need to do is build a, a payload, build a gadget chain as it's called. And there's a tool called the PHP generic gadget chains tool and it allows you to build payloads for a deserialization attack quite easily. 
So if you look down here, it has a bunch of different modules for different frameworks and things, including Laravel, luckily for us, WordPress, etc. Um, and what you do is you call the, the class and you tell it which one you want to do, and then you tell it the code you want to run. So we'll jump over to Tinker. Okay, hey load, we want that one. I'm gonna run that. So what it's done here, what we're doing is we're running the builder. We're telling it we want to use Laravel RC6. And we want it to do a die and dump on the configuration file, which is dumping all the configuration out, right? That is our serialized string. As we can see, it's using a couple of different classes. We've got message bag, we've got pending broadcast, you've got the dispatcher, there's broadcast event, eval loader, which sounds very suspicious, mock definition, etc. Now down the bottom here, we've got our DD config. So that's actually the code being run, and that's our payload. Now, what we want is to wrap that up as a cookie, which is a JSON encoded string. So we've got data here with our payload. We've got the expires, and we can grab this. And this is our custom session message that we're going to encrypt and throw into the cookie. So we'll jump over to the browser, back to our Oracle, throw it in, encrypt. Now we have, this is our new encrypted string. In the browser, we'll go over here, oops. We'll put in our new string, go enter. Then up in the URL, refresh the page. And there we have our die and dumped configuration for the application. So on the services, there's all our keys, database, oops, database connections, MySQL. There's our database connections, app. We have an encryption key, among other things. So what we've done here is we've run our code, our do we've die and dump the configuration onto the screen, but we could run anything we want here, do whatever code we want. So upload backdoors, create new accounts, modify things, um, you know, proxy onto the command line, whatever. We can do whatever we want. We have full control over this account now, over this site, I should say. Which for the site owner is a humongous problem. Okay, so I'll clear that out and we'll Google one final thing in the time we've got remaining. Okay, so as an attacker, when you're looking around, you're going to be sending in different things. And one of the common things you look for is SQL injection. And you can identify that generally by throwing in a single quote like that and then submitting a form. And if you get an error back, it's a good indicator that the query failed somehow. And that generally means that it's vulnerable to SQL injection. So we're going to use a tool called SQL Map, which is a penetration tool, a testing tool that is designed for finding SQL injection. So we'll grab the URL. Go back to our command line, go URL, throw that in, oops, P. So we're telling it the parameter is the search parameter. We know it's Laravel, so we can assume that the table is going to be called users, name, email, and we're going to pull out the name in the email column and we're going to dump that. So now what it's going to do is attempt to execute um, SQL injection on that URL and extract the information from the database. It's actually a blind SQL injection um, vulnerability in this case because there's no data being displayed on the screen, but that's okay. It can use tools such as a sleep, as you can see at the top of the screen, in order to set a timing. And it says, you know, if the value is this, great, or if it's this, then sleep. And then you can use the timing of the request, see how long it took, to work out the actual values of different characters. As we can see as it's going down, that it's figuring out, got a user here, Eleanor, there's our evil hackers loaded up here. We've got Jeffrey, and then up to Steven. There we go. We now have all the users from the database dumped out on the screen for our use. We can do what we want. And because we have full access to the database through this, we can dump whatever information we want. So for example, I could do messages, which is the table that contains all the messages, and we can dump, dump that. I'll just throw that onto the side of the screen and run that along. Throw that over here, let that run. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something. Um, the notes from the talk are on my site there. Um, also, um, you can, if you've got any questions, hit me up on Twitter or send me an email, or I'll be in the chat, hopefully, um, to answer any questions on there. So thank you very much. And yeah, just watch this tick through. So what it's doing now is it's just pulling out the, um, the encrypted value. This is quite a long one. Up here, we grab the... Uh, the columns from the table. So yeah, I'll just leave that to sit. Yeah, and if we had enough time, we could sit there and watch the whole thing go, but I think my time is, is done. So as I said, thank you very much.